Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice, so I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Momsiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss the ups, the downs, and anxieties of motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this Momsiety together. Welcome to episode 13 of the Momsiety Club podcast. Today, you get to hear a conversation between myself and freelance writer Jordi Lippi McGraw. She is a mom to a two-year-old who was living in New York City in Manhattan until March 13th, and she will share with us her experience leaving the city, her experience parenting, managing anxiety, and continuing to manage the unknown. Jordi has been a lifestyle writer or editor for about 10 years and focuses on travel and wellness. She's contributed to the New York Times, Condé Nast Traveler, Architectural Digest, Vogue, Cosmo, Forbes, and many more. She's traveled to every continent, including Antarctica, when she was 21 weeks pregnant. That is amazing. She has her own website, The Well Traveler, where she discusses her journeys. And yes, if you Google her name, she was the reporter who interviewed Stormy Daniels years ago. She's had a lot of fascinating, amazing experiences pre having her child as well as post. She shares how she has traveled with her son to many different places, which is amazing. Jordi also has a great take on handling anxiety and having some self-care time because she as well is a holistic health coach. Before I get into the interview, I just want to share a few things with you. I want to thank you for listening to the podcast. It means so much to me that the podcast is shared and helping moms everywhere. And on that note, I am excited to announce that uh, I, with the Momsiety Club, was awarded a scholarship to attend Podcast Movement uh, Virtual, which is a, it is the largest podcast convention where there's lots of education and things. So I'll get to learn more about this platform that I'm using to share with you these stories so that I can hopefully make them better and just continue sharing people's journeys, helping moms and helping you. All right, without further ado, here is my conversation with Jordi Lippi McGraw. Thank you, Jordi, for joining us. Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, uh, you definitely have a interesting story. You have your own podcast as well, Diaper Baggage, right? Yes, I do. I um, host that, co-host that with my friend Juliet, who has a four-year-old daughter. So we're sort of in different places, different genders when it comes to our children. But yes, we also have a podcast as well that talks all about getting rid of the mom guilt. Yes, I love it. It is fun to listen to, especially (laughs) it ties in really. I was listening to your, what you've learned in quarantine just the other day. So that ties into here. And you did mention a lot that there was anxiety and things Mm -hmm. involved. So you have a interesting perspective to share with the listeners as well um, as maybe some people who have experienced it. And some people who are like, Oh, what would have have been like if we were in that hot spot zone? So you were in New York and you left New York on March 13th. So yeah. tell us about yourself first before we dive <laughs> way into the, the deep, dirty stuff. <laughs> sure. Well, um, I am a mom to a two-year-old Wilder who is adorable, but has lots and lots of energy. And like you mentioned, we live in New York City. Well, we did until March. and um, I'm a full-time freelance writer covering mostly travel writing. I do some parenting stuff. I also uh, do design. So, you know, a lot of lifestyle type writing, but, um, you know, we were very lucky. I got to 
be around my son a lot, which was really nice, especially in those, like, you know, those first, like, couple of really pivotal years. It's been really nice to, even though I'm working to be around, it made, it allowed, you know, breastfeeding to be a lot easier than most women have it. So in that sense, anxiety was reduced because I had that privilege of getting the kind of the best of both worlds. Like I love working, but it was also nice to have the flexibility to be home for my son when I, when I wanted to be, which I know a lot of women don't get that privilege. So I feel very fortunate. And um, we've also had you know, my job has provided a lot of opportunities for us to travel um, as a family. And that's been incredible. I think Wilder has been to something like seven or eight countries uh, oh, wow. before he was two, something like that. I, I can't remember the tally right now. And um, it's been an incredible learning experience as a mom to have those opportunities because like talk about, you know, you're dealing with all of these changes in the first couple of years and like toss in a foreign country and travel and it really is just like, you know, an intense course yes. <laughs> in trying to uh, learn all about your child. So, but it's been great to be able to like see him in all of these different places. So yeah, I'm currently still a full-time freelance writer, but unfortunately travels on hold for right now. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, um, what was your favorite place that you went and seeing it through his eyes? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, some of the trips he was just so young, like he, we went to Portugal, I think when he was like 10 weeks old. So, um, that, oh my gosh, how did you, so that would have got, gotten me to go insane, <laughs> but that's amazing. I love when seeing and hearing how people do that and just showing like, I think part of like the whole parenting is when we were first parents, we were like, we want to be like these, this, like our friend couple, <laughs> they just go ahead. The kid fits in. It's not like stuck at home. So that's wonderful. You know, the kid just fits in and they grow along with you. Yeah. I mean, look, 10 weeks is probably actually easier than like at a year or a year and a half because they're, they're just blobs. Um, and you're not worrying about like sleep schedules and wake times and things. So, and you can just like strap them to you and go and you can breastfeed anywhere if you're breastfeeding or, you know, get a bottle, right. whatever it is that, that is you so need true. to do. So yeah. like, it kind of is easy because you could kind of do whatever you wanted, you know, now that there's naps involved in times and feet, like all, you know, all these things that you have to worry about, it's become a lot more difficult. Um, but, you know, a great learning experience for sure. Um, you know, once they start to get a little more active and like want to bounce around in, in the seat, I think like around a year to 18 months is really, really tough with traveling yes. because yeah. they want to move everywhere, but you can't like distract them with an iPad yet. They don't care. Now he's at an age where he could like sit for, you know, a couple hours and watch something on an iPad and just be like, be quiet. But, you know, at, that period was a, was a little rough, but we went, the last trip we took before the pandemic was at the very end of February, like right before the shutdown. And we went to um, Mexico and it was a really, a really fun trip with him because we did like a street food tour and he just like ate tacos off the street and uh, fried things that I was trying for the first time. And you know, he just kind of, he just loved it. And he, I was so surprised at how, you know, incredibly, like he was actually into art, not in the way that an adult is into art, but like mm -hmm. just seeing different things and ask, starting to ask questions. It was really, really fun to, to watch that. Um, and we went and we, before we went to Mexico city, we stayed at um, Rosewood Mayacoba, which is a beautiful, beautiful resort. And um, they just, they tailor everything to how, you know, whatever you want. And so they really, we wanted to focus on Wilder. So they would like fill the bathtub with balloons and bubbles. And so he just had like oh a blast. God. It was so, it was so fun just to be able to like take advantage of those little luxuries that, um, you know, you, you're not going to provide at home. Maybe I'll do a glow stick bath once in a while, but I'm certainly <laughs> not doing like full balloons and bubble bath. Yeah. <laughs> so that was probably my favorite um, destination. And one other, uh, we went to Charleston last September and it was just like a really easy trip, especially coming from the East Coast. We didn't have to worry about time changes. Everyone was super, super kid friendly, which was so nice. Um, and it was just like that Southern hospitality and like slower pace of life made it for, made for like a really nice trip with a child. Yeah, I've heard great things about there. And, and we also... I love that same age was when we took Ruben around a lot for, it was again for my business as well. And yeah, Atlanta was amazing. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. 
I can yeah. imagine Every, anywhere that like loves kids, it just re- releases that anxiety. Portugal was the same way. Like, you know, we had a, a 10 week old who, you know, would cry all the time. And I remember we were in this one restaurant we had, you know, to take him outside uh, to comfort him. And the restaurant just like took, you know, our food away, kept it warm and then like brought it back, like no questions. So like, Oh no, don't worry about it. We've got kids. We understand. Oh, so it was so just like, it, it just reduces that anxiety. Mm-hmm. Anytime someone can offer those, like, it's just like such a subtle and little, you know, action, but it makes such a big difference in reducing your anxiety for sure. That yes, it definitely does. Well, speaking of anxiety, <laughs> would you like to tell us about, uh, how you handled the pandemic. So you leading up to it, were you prepping, very anxious? How were things for somebody living in New York City uh, before everything broke out? I mean, honestly, in the weeks, you know, leading up to it, because we left March 13th. So, you know, like early March, I mean, in February, we were, we were on one, two, three, five planes. So we went to California for a long weekend. We were in Mexico. So like it really, it was on our radar. Don't get me wrong. We wiped down the seats and things like that, but we certainly didn't think it would get to the level that, you know, we're we're at now and that it got to. And we had a trip planned um, to go to France at the end of April. We were still counting on that. Um, And so I kept like holding out thinking like, okay, like it's not going to be bad. It's not going to be bad. And that week, that March, like those days, the the 11th, 12th, my husband was told not to come into the office anymore. A couple of people had tested positive in his office. And, you know, those days I was like, okay, you know, I was talking to um, our, our babysitter, Jojo, and she, you know, we're talking, okay, like next week, let's not take Wilder to group classes. Like we were sort of coming up for, coming up with a plan, but none of it really entailed like leaving the city. It was just like, okay, we're just going to be a little bit more cautious. And then I remember we went for a walk on March 12th and we went, we walked past the Trader Joe's line and it was like wrapped all the way around the block. And my husband Ross and I, we turned to each other and we're like, we can't do this. Like we, this is going to be too intense. And it was raining. And we're like, where would we take Wilder if it's raining? We're stuck inside. We can't go out to get things because it's too crowded And that's when we made the decision. I mean, it went from like, okay, next week, we're just going to take it easier to like in a couple of hours, making the decision, we're going to leave tomorrow and go to um, my in-laws place in in Pennsylvania. And um, yeah, so we just kind of made that decision and left all within 24 hours. Um, But the days leading up to it, we certainly kept thinking that we were going to stay and we were going to go to France and all of this was going to happen. And even when we left, we're like, okay, you know, a couple of weeks maybe a month. Right. And right. then it started to, to set in that, nope, this is going to be a, the long haul. Um, there was still a period of time for about a month, a month and a half where our lease was up in May. And we're like, do we renew it? Do we, we were looking for another apartment while we were still in quarantine thinking like, oh, we'll be back in time for Wilder's birthday in June. And like that created so much anxiety because there was just so much unknown. And you're trying to make these like big life decisions. We were trying to decide if we're going to send to wild or to preschool because those, you know, those down payments were due if we were going to do that, but where are we going to live? We don't know what our apartment's going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, Job security is suddenly like up in the air. I'm a freelance writer, you know, writing about travel and this is getting put on hold. I might not have, I might not be making money. I mean, I, I had no, no idea. And that anxiety lasted for a couple of months easily. It was my husband and I would go out for a walk every night after Wilder went to sleep because we were living with my in-laws. So they would be home and we would just sort of like have these really intense conversations, trying to figure out what like our immediate future would be. Mm -hmm. And it changed every day. Some days it was like, okay, let's go rent in the city. Some days it'd be like, let's go find a house in New Jersey. Some days it was like, okay, let's just stay here in Pennsylvania. And, um, it was exhausting. It was exhausting. And, very disconcerting because you just I'm better I do better with like at least having an answer even if the answer is not the one that I want having Mm -hmm. an answer for me reduces my anxiety because then I can it's something tangible that I can deal with the unknown drives me absolutely insane as for probably for most people so it was like 
crafting all these scenarios and running through what life would be like. Um, and finally, I think it was in June, we decided to, um, my in-laws amazingly have a, another condo just outside of Philadelphia. And we were like, okay, we're going to move there. So we have our own space and then we'll like wait it out from there. And incredibly, um, our babysitter from New York moved down here to be with us. So, um, oh, wow. really, it's been really nice to, to have her here because one, she helps tremendously and two, it just keeps a sense of like normalcy for, for Wilder, um, uh, because there's been so much change that it's nice to have her back and have that be like a positive, consistent force in his life and have someone else to like hang out with besides his parents. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> That's sort of the story, kind of in a nutshell, not really. That was sort of long-winded, but. No, that was interesting. But I think some of the the main point everybody experienced, especially everybody with anxiety, was it just added to it the unknown. Yes. And there was this, it, still, there's unknown about oh, yeah. tons. And actually this morning we got a notice that, one of not the same cohort in school, Ruben's in first grade, but another grades of that are combined. Um, there was an exposure. So they were not at school this morning. And I got the email and I was like, oh, I guess that makes sense why there weren't a lot of people at drop off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, now I'm like, so are any of those kids siblings in my kids class hey, 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 like, run through these list of questions so through yeah how did you handle I mean you had your nightly walks with yes. your husband which that's that those are our walks as well and keep it you, ca- you kind of have to set that boundary especially when Wilder gets older if you take him along because that used to be our our chat time yeah. <laughs> now the six-year-old <laughs> What, yeah. is what is that? What does that mean? <laughs> Who's that? Oh, and love him to death. He is just like, okay, we just need to have a talk. This is our only chance to talk. Just hold on a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mommy and daddy are talking right now. That's what I say. Like, we'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> like 10 seconds before he asks again. Right, right. So you had your walks and I know you are very centered in your health and wellness as well. Did you do some other things to help kind of relieve your anxiety and stress? Yeah. I mean, I am a big fan of working out. Um, I used to love going to the gym. I haven't certainly haven't gone to the gym since March. Um, so I, um, adopted some, you know, found some at home workouts to do and invested in some nicer weights because I was just using kind of what you know, milk cartons or things <laughs> or around the house. Um, you know, I would go for some runs. Uh, I, my goal, even before the pandemic was to try to get in 10,000 steps a day, uh, just so I can constantly keep my body moving. And I find walking to be very meditative for me. It allows me to process what's going on in my life. And, you know, since I'm a writer, I'm constantly like, my brain is constantly working and I like you know, to force myself to be creative sometimes. And I can write, you know, uh, five, eight, 10 stories in a day sometimes. And so my brain is just sort of fried and that's on top of, you know, taking care of a kid. Um, so walks just kind of like release that pressure a bit. So I certainly aim to, to do that. Um, we're in the, we just started potty training yesterday. So, um, walks are not happening uh, at the moment. Cause usually I would try to get like 6,000 steps in first thing in the morning and take wilder for a walk, but we are very much inside <laughs> for the next few days. So I'll get back on my, my steps. Um, and I also, um, you know, I'm a fan of, of meditation. I like to follow, you know, tr- more traditional meditation. So I'll follow guided meditations on the calm app, um, at night to help sleep. If I feel like my mind is racing, um, and I'm a big proponent for, for therapy. So I, you know, I've, I had a therapist that I've been going to for a decade now, ever since my dad died suddenly. And, um, I still check in with her, you know, once a month just to have another person to, to talk to, because, you know, that's a hard part as I'm sure, you know, with quarantine and, and feeling isolated. And I, you know, I haven't seen my friends in months and, I'm in an entirely new place with no friends. Um, so it's really just like, you know, 
um, my nanny and my husband and my two year old. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, Zoom fatigue is wearing so you don't talk, chat with your friends as much. Maybe you catch up with them on text or call once in a while. But, you know, just having that sort of outside perspective with a therapist is, is always just really, really helpful. I'm like, everyone should have a therapist. <laughs> They're great. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Actually, one of my things, one of my clients, when I was teaching per, in person, I mean, I'm back to one-on-one -on -one masked up and everything, uh, but was saying, you know, I feel like I have my therapy session along with my workout. And I was like, Hey, I'm happy to be that because it's a two way street. It's having a, a human to talk to, which just gives you perspective on everything that is going on. So Absolutely. And, you know, it's a huge difference from the life that we lived seven months ago in New York city when you're surrounded by thousands of people. And, um, you know, so it's a big shift in some ways, really good shift. Um, but it's still, it's a big shift. So it's like getting, you know, used to this whole new life. And there was this period where, you know, where we lived with my, my in-laws for a certain period of time. Now we're in this new place. And it's like, we know we don't want to live here forever. What's the next step. So it's like, you know, in just in a year, it's going to be this incredible amount of, of change. Um, so I think it's really important to like, and it can be hard. I'm not saying it's easy, but to like focus on those, you know, acts of self-care just to like, you know, find your equilibrium even. Right. <laughs> right. Not, even not even shooting like high here, just like, just, just stay like on somewhat of an even playing field with everything that's going on. Yes, that is very true. <laughs> So now, since you had moved in with your in-laws, how was your anxiety there? Because I know some people, I'm not trying to get, get a no. family fight started. Let's not have anything like that. I mean, my in-laws are great. Um, they, they really are wonderful. And they're very, um, you know, no, no drama, which is like the opposite of, of my family. So it's certainly like a, a calm environment. Um, which is nice in a pandemic. Yes. Um, I think where the anxiety stemmed from is just no matter how welcoming their home is and how helpful they are, you're still not in your, your space. Um, and that was really hard. And it's still hard because we don't, all of our things have been in storage, you know, since March we're, we're living off of, you know, these same clothes that I brought with us, you know, I, maybe I went out and purchased a couple things from like old Navy recently, but you know, we have just what we came in in a couple of suitcases. So I think it's, it's hard. And I know it's just things, but it's, it's still like a sense of your space. And there's um, that comfort that comes along with just even that little thing that's sitting on, you know, your dresser. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just, you know, all those, all those memories and, it, it was hard because once we realized we weren't going back, it's like, wow, March 12th was the last night we ever spent in that apartment. And that apartment was where we brought, you know, our son home to and where, you know, we gave him his first bath and, and, you know, all it was so much more. And I think it just felt like we lost a sense of home and we didn't necessarily get that back, even though we were living with family, it still wasn't our home and our, and our, and our stuff is still gone. And it also, I think is just, you know, very basic things like it can be easy with your family unit uh, unit with, you know, me and my husband and my son, like making decisions, knowing what's going to work for us that day. But now you have two other people to, to take into consideration. Right meals or timing of things or schedules. And that added some anxiety because both my husband and I are trying to work, trying to figure out who's going to watch Wilder. We don't want, you know, my in-laws to watch them all, you know, watch him all day. That's not reasonable. So that, um, created some anxiety for us. I don't think for them, they, they were again, very lovely and willing to help however, but it was more just like, we didn't want that. And we just wanted, you know, we just wanted our, our lives back. So at least now, um, being in the condo, it's, it's us and, you know, our incredible, our incredible nanny. Um, and it just feels like we have a little sense of control when everything seems out of control. And it's those little things that I think make a, make a huge difference. Make a huge uh -huh. difference. That, yeah. That's actually a topic of one of my 
that, that that's like the topic I think could be every single day applied to everything. Little things make a big difference for mindset, little things for your body make a huge difference. Uh, I love that that is that you are saying that as well. And that more and more people are recognizing that, you know, it doesn't have to be self-care is not going to the spa, you know, Although weekly, daily. Nice. Yeah, no. So self-care is going to the spa, <laughs> but that is not the only way to do self-care. This, I think this has made people realize that, you know, five minutes to yourself, you have, you, what is realistic self-care that we can do right now and making sure that we're doing that. So we're not, you know, going nuts. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's really important that, um, it's for women and moms to know, to like, to ask for it. I think, especially in situations like this, you know, you sort of go into survival mode and you just take on so much of, of the burden mm-hmm. and it can be really hard. And I found it hard to ask for the time that I needed, um, which came a lot easier pre pandemic, um, because it was sort of, you know, things were running smoothly and when things aren't and you want to try to fix them, um, which I think, you know, you know, depression, I feel like is worrying about the past where anxiety is worrying about the future. So when you have this, you're in this like anxious state, um, it's, it's hard to get out of it. And so it takes that extra effort to like ask for that time away. And that took me a couple of months into the pandemic. And it's still something I struggle with to make sure like, hi, honey, I need, you know, an right. hour to myself. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want in that hour. That could be watching reality TV. It could be going for a walk. It whatever I want. I just need some time. Um, and I think it's important that people remember to ask for it. So yes, have these five, five minute self care things, but take the time that you need and take feel empowered to ask for it. I love that. Yes, the empowerment to ask. Um, you shouldn't have to take this all on. No one is, you know it's too much. It's too much of a burden to bear. Um, and yeah, just it, don't, don't expect to <laughs> ask for help. That that's a sign of like being, you know, strong. And when you ask for help, when you need it, it certainly makes me a better mom and a better wife, um, and a better friend and, you know, a better sister and a better daughter. So when you take that time, it ultimately just benefits yourself and everyone around you. So yes, that is very true. And I love how you put that. Uh, and then talking about self-care, what is something you have done for yourself today or this week? Um, today is tough because, <laughs> because we're potty training. So my, uh, my day is very much taken up with that. But um, in the past week, I, um, I, I love truffles. It's like one of my kind of passions in life. And uh, October is white truffle season. And normally, you know, when we were in the city, I would go to like white truffle tastings and and dinners and it would be like my, you know, my special little holiday. And sadly, I can't go anywhere to do that, but I found a virtual truffle tasting. And I did that um, a couple of days ago and it was just me. I had, they sent a bottle of wine and some truffles and I got to watch a, a cooking demonstration. And it was just like purely me for an hour. And it was like right before bedtime. And I was like, nope. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take the time. And it was really, really fun. So that was sort of like my little self-care thing was indulging in truffles. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I love how you mentioned how it was right before bedtime and talking about your podcast with mom guilt, getting rid of the mom mm-hmm. guilt, because that is, I think everyone can not, I think all moms can relate to that where there are many times when you're like, Oh no, that's a for before to bedtime. I can't do that. Or that's after bedtime. I don't know if the kids kid or kids are going to be asleep by then. So I can't say yes to it yeah. or I say, Nope, this is what I'm doing. Don't feel guilty about it. Yes. It's happening. <laughs> yes. Well, truffles certainly will put me over the edge. <laughs> I'll do anything for truffles. <laughs> <laughs> would you give yourself any advice going back in the beginning uh, of, from some of the lessons that you've learned? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I should say, you know, in general, like way, way pre-pandemic when I first had Wilder, you know, I was really, I was lucky that I didn't, um, you know, have any sort of traditional postpartum depression or anxiety, um, you know, 
breastfeeding came really easy to me. Um, I, you know, I enjoyed being a new mom and being in a city as a new mom. There were certainly like down moments, don't get me wrong. Um, but I didn't have any sort of those kind of, you know, symptoms, but 10 months later after having Wilder, um, I started weaning from breastfeeding because he started pushing away from, from me. And I just, at the, you know, I tried it just pumping and I just kind of felt like a milk machine. I wasn't getting that same sort of satisfaction of, of feeding him anymore. So I decided to wean at that point, since we were going to give him, um, regular milk when he turned a year anyway. Um, and it was at that time, unknowingly that I, um, started having really, really bad, um, depression, anxiety, um, symptoms, and I didn't know where it was coming from because no one told me um, that it could be linked to weaning. So I suffered for quite some time. And I remember just being like, it was sensory overload. Any, you know, sounds in the city just seemed like it was like uh, killing me. And I remember like a delivery man said something to me. That I can't remember what it was now. And it just like set me off. It was like, and I, and I just like went into the closet and sat there and cried and just remember thinking like, oh my God, like I hate being a mom. I, I, I'm terrible at this. I'm so overwhelmed and this is how I'm going to feel forever. And it was awful. It was an awful, awful feeling. And it wasn't until I brought it up to a friend who said, oh, the same thing happened to me when I weaned. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you mean the two right. things are related? No doctor ever told me this. No other mom ever told me this. She's like, yeah, as soon as, you know, I went back on birth control pill, it regulated my hormones and I felt a whole lot better. Lo and behold, I did the same thing. And, you know, it, those, all those like really intense symptoms went away. And so like now any mom I meet, I'm like, just heads up. If you're, <laughs> if you're going to breastfeed, be aware that like postpartum can hit, you know, months down the line um, because it's a hormone fluctuation can cause those, mm-hmm. those things. So um that, that was really hard for me. So I just wanted to like, sort of put that, um, that anxiety motherhood that is, in perspective. That is <laughs> wonderful because yeah, actually I'm going through the same thing right now. Whereas like I had met with my postpartum psychiatrist who specializes it. She's like, okay, well, you know, we're at this point, I think you're ready, go on. And then all of a sudden it's, he's starting to nurse less or I'm working more straight through and, you know, the whole being home pandemic also threw (laughs) that all off because then he was nursing a ton. So, and I'm going, what is going on? I have felt great for months and now I'm getting like this rage again, this, uh, this overwhelm, all like the same exact, um, thoughts of, I can't do this. What was I thinking? And I'm going, oh, I think it's, that's what it is. Definitely. It's because there's no set even keel anymore. The hormones are going crazy. Yeah. Um, So that is, thank you for sharing that. Um, Because I don't think anybody goes to talk to their OBGYN about that at all because they're like, you're you're, breastfeeding. You're done. Right. (laughs) No no one cares about the mom anymore. It's like, nope, you're good to go. Bye. See you later. Um, so that, I mean, that's certainly like one thing, just sort of, maybe it's not advice, but just, I always like to say that and and any chance that I get, so other women don't feel so alone the way that I did, that it's, it's something that is very common. I found out from a lot of women after the fact. So I like to like share that up front. And then the other thing is, you know, the piece of advice would be you're not a bad mom, but sometimes you have bad days and that's okay. And I wish I would have thought about that sooner. Um, And that also kind of goes hand in hand with everything is a phase. (laughs) Everything is a phase. So you feel like you're never going to get out of whatever stage it's in that's making you miserable and it passes. Um, And I still remind myself of that when things get tough. (laughs) Right. It passes in the blink of an eye. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So those are probably the two things that I kind of wish I would have known or taken to heart um, a lot sooner because I think it would have relieved some of that anxiety, um, knowing knowing those two things and thinking, shifting my mentality in that way. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful wisdom. (laughs) 
And You're welcome. <laughs> I love when I'm wise. Thank you. Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us now? I'm going to put links to find your writing, to find your website in the show notes. I, I'm, I also happen to be a certified holistic health coach. So I work with clients, moms and, and, and not moms, um, to help them work on having, uh, to help them work on knowing that they can change their mindset around things to reduce anxiety, to break out of a rut. If you're feeling like you're in a rut um, and it's all based on those little changes that we talked about um, coming up with, you know, you could go, if your goal is to lose weight, sure. You know, a trainer can come in and say, you know, juice and work out, you know, seven days a week, but that's, it's too, it's too daunting and, and you're right. going to fail. It's too much to take on. So when I work with my clients, it's focusing on those little things, like those little changes and what you can add into your life, um, to essentially to, you know, to create your dream life. And it's possible, you know, radical change can happen with small changes. And that's what I work on my, with, when I work with clients, that's what I work on them with. Okay. So we'll have the link for that in the show notes. So, awesome. um, well, Thank you so much. This has been wonderful getting to chat with you and hear a different perspective because we're in, you know, suburban where you came to (laughs) completely different experience. And my experience with the city was my brother who no children and they were there and they thought they felt anytime they went outside, it was like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to get sick. They left the city and he just moved back this last week. So he said it's yeah. real. Yeah. yeah. It's, and I couldn't imagine doing that with a child um, because, you know, especially a two-year-old or he was, you know, at the time he was a little over a year and a half and, but turn, you know, turn two in June. And it's like, he needs space to mm-hmm. run around. And um, it's actually been quite a blessing to be um, in the suburbs or in the country because, you don't think about it as much. And that's nice because I think sometimes our anxieties can be put on our children unknowingly. So the less anxious you are, the more that they can go with the flow. And he's like, wow, just like living his best life, playing in dirt, you know, he loves going to farms and seeing tractors. And it just shows you how resilient kids are. And the more that you can be relaxed and not anxious, um, you know, the better it is for them. And so for us leaving the city, I think it, it allowed us to, to have that, that's physical space and mental space to make, um, what could otherwise be like, even what your brother went through that, that fear of going Mm -hmm. outside and, you know, telling your kid, don't touch this and don't go near, don't, you know, you kind of have to still do that now at at a playground, but certainly not to the extent that it would have been in, in Manhattan. He could just go out into my in-laws backyard and run around, and, you know, not worry about masks and things like that. He can just be a, a kid in nature. And, um, the, you know, we're so lucky that we had that as, as an, op- as an option for him. A lot of people didn't. And, um, yeah, I feel very grateful. Well, thank you, Jordy, for sharing your experiences and giving us an inside look into what it was like to experience the pandemic starting from the beginning when living in New York City. As Jordy shared, some of the most difficult things come from not being in your own space. And even though you're with family, not having that sense of home. In the show notes, I link to Jordy's website and podcast if you'd like to hear more from her. So now's the time for me to ask you do you have any quarantine stories? anxiety stories, anxiety moments that you would like to share with other moms. I love hearing from you and you can write me at momsiety or sorry, hello at momsietyclub.com. That's M-O-M-X-I-E-T-Y club.com. You can connect with me on the social media channels. I am at Momsiety Club, or you can call and leave a message at 717-461-2283. Again, all of those um, numbers and media handles and emails are listed in the show notes. Since we discussed COVID and isolation 
and kind of losing the that normalcy of for Jordy having so many people around to having very few people around. There is a free downloadable on how to help a new mom from afar uh, at join.momsietyclub.com. If you are searching for a place to have both emotional and physical support for the stress, anxiety, and overwhelm that comes along with motherhood, and also a place to share in the joys and fun stuff that happens, just head to join.momsietyclub.com. When you're ready to join the Momsiety Club, there you will find access to the Momsiety Club membership or working with me one-on-one where we can focus on physical and mental well-being so that you can be the best mom you can be. All right, and that is the end of this episode. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for listening and stay tuned next week for another interview with an awesome mom sharing her experiences so that you don't feel so alone. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK.